Tom, thank you so much. Great singing, great singing, great old hymns with a common theme that was running through them all, asking questions. And it's all about what we believe. The crux of Christian belief is the gospel, the gospel message that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners and to shed his blood for us and that's what we've been singing about so if you can turn in your bibles to the passage that randy read for us romans chapter 8 sorry romans chapter 1 of uh, verse 8 romans 8 is a wonderful chapter too but romans 1 one of my favorite chapters romans chapter 1 and especially this passage verses 8 to 17 and we are going to be talking about getting excited about the gospel, getting excited about the wonderful truth that Jesus shed his blood for us. It's time to get excited, people. It's time to rise up. We're coming out of this pandemic, and I believe God is going to renew our church. He's going to renew us, and he's going to get us excited again. And what are we going to get excited about? That's right. So are we just going to get excited about, oh, yeah, you know, we've done some nice things to our church, or we're getting more people coming in? No. We want to get excited about what really matters, and that's people coming to Christ and people getting saved, and people finding that wonderful hope in Jesus Christ. And that's what we need to get excited about. Well, the story is told about a young rookie barber this one time who was so excited about starting his new career, and he had just opened his own brand new barber shop, and his first customer just happened to be a policeman. And in his enthusiasm and excited the young, excitement, the young barber said to the officer, since you do such a good job protecting us and you're a first responder and watching over us, today I'm going to give you a free haircut. Well, the policeman really appreciated that. And the very next morning when the barber came to his shop, there were a dozen donuts waiting for him at his front door. Well, that made the young barber even more excited. And then the next day, a florist came in for a haircut, and the same thing happened. The barber, in his excitement, gave him a free cut, too. And the next morning, he came to work, and there were a dozen flowers waiting for him at the door. And of course, that made him even more excited. And then the next day, the same thing happened, but this time it was a pastor. And the barber gave him a free haircut and told him how much he appreciated all the work that the pastor did. And the very next morning when the barber came to work, there were 12 other pastors waiting for him. <laughs> the Webster Dictionary says that the meaning of excitement is to be stirred or thrilled. That's the idea of excitement. So today we want to talk about getting excited about Jesus again, getting excited about the gospel. When I did the, well, I gave the message at my sister's funeral a week ago, there was a, a level of excitement in the air. And uh, different ones said that they hadn't really been to a Christian funeral before, and there was a real air of hope and excitement and being positive. You know, when you think about our world today, people get excited about Jubilee celebrations and they get excited about all sorts of things, sports, celebrities, material things. But as believers in Jesus, we need to get excited again about the gospel and what it means and what we have and what we believe in because I mentioned during that message at my sister's funeral, what is it gonna be like when we're laying on our deathbed? Because I was there when she passed, I was holding her hand with a few others, and it gave me a lot of time to think. What am I going to be living for and thrilled about at the end of my life? 
The book of Romans here is often called the Constitution of Christianity or the Christian Manifesto. Some people have even gone so far as to say that this is the greatest theological book ever written. And the Apostle Paul, toward the end of his life and the end of his ministry, he gives us this great presentation, this great summary of what the Christian gospel is all about. And if you want to understand who we are as Christians and who God is and what the good news about Jesus is, if you want to learn the fundamentals of the faith and the basics of Christianity, read the book of Romans. Like I've said before, Romans is Christianity 101. And in the first chapter, we have the greeting part right at the very beginning. We have the greeting part in verses 1 to 7. Paul is writing to these early Roman Christians from another city. He's writing from Ephesus in modern-day Turkey, Asia Minor. And he doesn't really know most of these people. He didn't start the church in Rome. So in this first section, at the beginning, he introduces himself and he introduces his gospel, his message, what he's all about and what we should be all about. And in verse 1, he says, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle. This is the very first verse. And set free, set apart for the gospel of God. That's Paul's introduction. That's what he's all about. And remember, we have said as Christians, that should be our introduction too. We should have that same mindset that we are servants, that we are bond slaves of the gospel, uh, just like he was a servant. Uh, that should be our introduction. We should have that same mindset that we are servants of Christ Jesus. And that's our calling. Our calling should be to represent him, represent Jesus in the world. Paul says he's called to be an apostle. That just means to be a representative, a messenger. And he says that he is set apart for the gospel. Are we set apart for the gospel? That's our commission too as Christians, to live lives that are set apart. Even the idea of the church, the word church is ecclesia in the Greek, and that means the set apart ones that are not in the world. We are set apart spiritually from the world. Lives that are not devoted to ourselves or devoted to worldly things, but devoted to God. That's the only way we can shine the light of the gospel if we are set apart. And then in verses 2 to 7, the next section leading up to our passage today, Paul moves from introducing himself to introducing his message. So look at verse 2. He talks about the gospel being something that was promised long ago. It wasn't some newfangled last-minute thing or last-minute fad. It was something God had planned from the very beginning, before time began. And then in verses 3 to 4, he talks about the good news that God sent his son, his son who was a descendant of King David, Jesus Christ our Lord, who was raised from the dead, he says, by the power of the Holy Spirit. And now through him in verse five, we receive the precious gift of faith and we're given a calling to be his representatives. That's what we're supposed to be about. Just like Paul being called to be an apostle, we are also called and given the commission and the commission to bring others and to call other people to that same amazing grace that we've experienced. So that's the introduction part. And now we come to our passage this morning, to verses 8 to 17. And every good book or every good essay needs a main point. And if you want to know what the main point of the book of Romans is, this is it in this passage. I remember teaching high school students and telling them, you can't just ramble on in your essays. You need a main point. That's what a thesis is. It's the main theme, the thesis statement, the main idea. And guess what? Paul's main point for him writing the entire book of Romans is right here in our passage, right at the very end of our passage in verse 17. This is it. So let's look there at verse 17. This is 
the book of Romans in a nutshell, really. It says here, verse 17, chapter 1, For in the gospel the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last. Just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. That's the main idea. And that's really the main idea of our faith. That's the main point here. That getting right with God, having His, God's righteousness, being forgiven, being accepted, it's all about God revealing Himself to us. It's about Him reaching down to us and giving us His grace and saving us and giving us His righteousness and giving us even the gift to believe, the gift of faith. It's by faith, Paul says, from beginning to end, first to last. And that was such a, that was fantastic news for Paul. Because he came out of a system where it was anything but faith. It was a system of religious works that he came out of. And that was something that he could get so excited about. And he uses words like, be, excuse me, being eager. And he's just chomping at the bit to share the gospel here uh, when, he, when he gets to Rome. And that was something that really got Paul fired up because he'd been a Pharisee. He had been one of the most religious men alive. And he thought getting right with God was all about being religious, trying to be good enough, trying to be righteous enough through himself, through his own goodness, through his own effort, through his own religious good works. Remember Jesus himself said in the book of Matthew, we have to be, we have to have a righteousness that's better than the Pharisees. And people interpret that all the wrong way. Or, and he also says, be perfect for, for God is perfect. Or God says, be perfect for I am perfect. And people get that all messed up. The Pharisees had a self-righteousness, just like everybody else on the planet, trying to be good, trying to do the right thing, trying to be successful in our own strength. But what we all need is help. Why? Because we're all sinners. That's why we need God to intervene and give us his righteousness. We all need a God kind of righteousness, not our own. That's why the good news of the gospel is so good and so exciting for Paul to realize that salvation and righteousness and going to heaven is all about God and who he is, his righteousness. It's not about me and my self-righteousness. What a relief. We are set free from trying to do it on our own. What a load lifted. That's something to get excited about. Someone has said, God will never love you more than he does right now. If we really understood that, that would set us free from, oh, I blew it. I blew it again and again and again. What a fantastic truth. It's not about what I do. It's all about him and what he's done. And of course, later on in the book of Romans, Paul uh, comes back against the argument that says, oh, well, then it's, if it's all by grace or if all, it's all by faith, then I don't do, have to do anything. I can just live like the devil and God will forgive me. Paul says, may it never be. Because if you are truly saved, if you've experienced God's grace and, and by faith you are trusting him and living for him, you'll want to keep living for him and you will not want to sin. And this is the very verse that spoke to another man in church history. And he was another very religious man, just like Paul was, just like Paul. His name was Martin Luther in the Middle Ages. He just happened to be a Catholic monk and a Catholic priest. And it was this verse, Romans 1, 17, that the just will live by faith, not by all the trappings and all the works that the Roman church had. And it was while he was teaching a university course on the book of Romans that he came across this verse. 
And he had been about as religious as you could possibly get. I've mentioned this before earlier. As a young monk, he went to Rome, Martin Luther did. He went to St. Peter's Basilica and he crawled on his stomach up hundreds and hundreds of steps, about 300 steps, kissing every step as penitence to pay for his sins. But he still never felt good enough, still never felt quite accepted by God. And then this verse, it hit him like a ton of bricks. God's the one who reaches down, not us trying to reach up. God's the one who reveals himself. He's the one who saves us by his grace. He's the one who draws us to himself. The righteous will live by faith, not by religion, not by trying to be good enough, not by good works. And Paul, uh, just Luther and Paul, very similar. They got so excited about that. That became... Martin Luther's thing, that the just will live by faith, that the gospel's all about faith and God's grace. He got so excited that he wrote a sermon that had 95 points. He really outdid me. I only usually have three or four. He had 95. And he hammered that sermon to the chapel door of the university where he taught. He went public with his newfound faith. And of course, that ignited the Protestant Reformation in Europe, all because Martin Luther came across this little verse in the book of Romans. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous or the just will live by faith. So again, that is something for us to grab a hold of and get excited about this morning. We can throw religion out the window. We can stop striving to be accepted. We can stop striving to measure up. All that we're called to do is to trust God and live by faith and please him and serve him. And so because of that, we need to rise up today. We need to get excited about this life-changing truth. We're just a little church here, but you know what? God can do amazing things through one person, like the Apostle Paul. I read a book once about the Apostle Paul, and it was entitled, The Man Who Turned the World Upside Down. A little church like ours can turn the world upside down with this great, where we may be little, but this truth is great. It's huge. And as a church, just like Paul, we don't want to be ashamed anymore. We want to stand up and be counted and get excited about our faith, share it, celebrate it, live it out. You know, right now, right today, in our town, there are people who are celebrating their belief system. And they're having a parade and they're having a festival today promoting their lifestyle and their sexual orientation. And they put us to shame sometimes with their fervor and their excitement. We need to rise up and be counted when it comes to the truth of the gospel and have that same kind of fervor, more fervor because it comes from God. And Paul starts telling these Roman Christians in verse eight now, that's why he wants to visit Rome. That's why he wants to see them. He wants to go to the capital city, to the center of the Roman Empire, to the center of paganism in the ancient world, and he wants to share the good news about Jesus with everybody, non-Christians and even Christians. You know, I've mentioned this before many times. I'll mention it again. There are many, even I would call evangelical churches today who don't talk very much about the gospel. Everything, everything but. And they don't mention sin or hell or the blood of Jesus or the cross. It's more self-help. It's more little talks about how you can be a better person. And yet, this is what we're supposed to be all about. The gospel 
is supposed to be everything. And even Christians need to hear it again and again to get excited, get renewed, get refreshed in what we believe, what is at the crux of why we exist. Paul was so convinced of this truth, this gospel, it was everything to him. It was the most important news you could ever have that God in his amazing grace saves wretches like us. And he reveals his righteousness to us. And as Christians today, if we can't get excited like Paul, if we can't get excited about the gospel, then something's wrong. We need a spiritual awakening. We need a good spiritual slap across the side of the head. I was going to say a kick somewhere, but we need to be called back to what our faith and our gospel is all about. So easy to get complacent. Me too. I'm right, right in there. So let's take a look at our passage now. And what I'd like us to do, I won't be as long as Martin Luther. I'm not going to have 95 points, but I'm going to have 10 points, or sorry, seven. That's what I came up with. Longer than what I usually have, but they're going to go really quick. We'll only be here to about two or three. Here, here are, sorry, I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. Here are seven results of believing the gospel or seven results of living a life of faith. And we see all these results in the life of the Apostle Paul right here in our passage leading up to this great statement in verse 17, the statement, the righteous will live by faith. So here we go. Number one, the first result of living a life of faith, just like Paul, is thankfulness. If you look at verse 8, look at verse 8. Paul says, first, uh, before anything else, I thank God. I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you because your faith is being reported all over the world. Paul's not just excited, he's thankful. 1 Thessalonians 5.18 says, Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. If you are truly saved and you are living a life of faith, you are going to be thankful for a few things in your life. You're not going to be miserable and negative. You're going to be positive and thankful and counting your blessings. And Paul didn't start this church in Rome, like we said. You know, he could have been a little jealous. He could have been envious of their success. But he's thankful for what God is doing there in Rome. That's one of the most basic results of receiving God's grace and receiving his righteousness. We become thankful. We're indebted. We're debtors to grace. And especially when it comes to other people. Instead of complaining or gossiping or feeling threatened or being jealous or wishing I had different people in my life, to be thankful. Thankful for the people around us. Thankful for the people in our church family. That's a sure sign of God's grace and his righteousness working in your life. A faithful life is a thankful life. And then number two, see, I'm moving along really quick. Number two, the second result of living a life of faith, of course, is commitment. Some kind of commitment. You know, if you have been a professing Christian for years and years and years, and there's not a lot of thankfulness and not a lot of commitment to God and to the local church, something's a little screwy. Look at verse 9. Paul says, God, whom I serve in my spirit in preaching the gospel of his son, is my witness how constantly I remember you. Paul is constant. He is committed, especially to the people of God and praying for them and loving them and reaching out to them. Paul is constantly remembering these people. He's not hit and miss. He's committed, he serves God and the people out of a sense of thanksgiving and gratitude and indebtedness. Like we said, he is a debtor to grace and that's what should be our motivation as believers today. Do you know what? If you have any other motivation 
for serving God or coming to church or being a part of any kind of ministry, you're going to be dead in the water so fast. If you're, you're doing it because you want to get applause from people or you want to be a little more popular or you have other motives, it's not going to go well. You'll get discouraged, really. I learned that in ministry when I was in church planting. And I had to be broken. I had to come very low to examine my motives. What am I doing all this for? It's not for the money. Let me tell you, back then, it wasn't for the money. And it, it couldn't be for the praise of people or to boost my ego or anything like that. It had to be because I was a debtor to grace. And I wanted to be committed because of what Jesus had done for me. And that's when that should be our motivation as believers today, thanking God for saving us, for forgiving us, for giving us his righteousness and getting excited about what God's done for us in our lives. Those hymns were wonderful hymns. I just have to say that got me fired up. And if we do that, if that becomes our motivation, then commitment won't be a forced thing or a begrudging thing. We'll want to give back to God. We'll want to give him the glory. We'll want to serve him. We'll want to be here on Sundays and for Bible studies. We want to be committed to serve others, not because we have to, but because we want to. We love to. That was Paul's heart. He was eager because a faithful life is a committed life. Then number three, the third result of living a life of faith, and these are not very profound. Another simple one, it's prayer. So thankfulness, commitment, prayer. Look at verse 10, Paul says, in my prayers at all time, times, and I prayed now at last by God's will, the way may be open for me to come to you. Paul's life is marked by prayer at all times. It was a way of life. And it's interesting here that he doesn't just pray for the Christians in Rome. He prays that God would open the way so that he could come to them. Meaning he's praying for more opportunities to share the gospel. That shows that he has surrendered himself to God's will. He wants God to open doors for him, give him more opportunities. That should be one of the main prayers in our own lives and in the life of our church. Lord, give us opportunities. May it be you opening doors. May it be you giving us new paths to go down and new windows and doors to open so we can share the good news not us trying to strategize and manipulate and trying to open doors it's god and that has to come through prayer and we've said that over the years in our church prayer has to be central and i think i've shared this before through the pandemic do you know what some of you don't know this there were some Wednesday afternoons at our prayer meeting and our Bible study. We had more people there than we did on Sunday morning. We had more people praying on Wednesday than we did on attending Sunday mornings. That showed that people were really serious about praying. And that's an obvious result of what comes from faith. And I personally believe that's one of the best ways to evangelize and to share our faith is to pray for opportunities. I try and do that every day. And I said this before, that's my kind of evangelism strategy. You know that I'm not the type of person who gets in your face and hits you over the head with a King James Bible. I'm, I'm not that kind of an evangelist. I'm more of a discipleship evangelist where God brings people and we want to invest ourselves in those people and let God be the one doing the work. That's right. And opening the doors. And it's to ask God every day to give us opportunities to share Jesus. And he does that. Sometimes it just comes out and somebody asks a question at the grocery store or starts talking about COVID. And then you start talking about the hope that you have through COVID and beyond this life. 
Then number four, the fourth result of living a life of faith is giving. Giving. You'll be a giver. Verses 11 to 12, Paul says, I long to see you so that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to make you strong. Paul is wanting to go there to impart something to them, to give something to them. And usually when we think of giving, we think of offerings or money. Paul wants to give himself. He wants to disciple them. He wants to build them up. He wants to encourage them. He says that is that you and I may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith. If we're going to survive as a church and if we're going to grow and we're going to expand, we need to be mutually encouraging each other and giving to each other. Paul was a giver. He wasn't a taker. He wanted to see these people so he could help them and encourage them and impart to them, support them, build them up in their lives. And that's something we need to ask ourselves today. Do I come to church to get or to give? Do I serve God because I'm going to get something out of it? Or do I have the attitude and the disposition that Paul had, that God had given him so much but for the grace of God go I. God's given me everything I want to give to others. I've been blessed to be a blessing. So a faithful life is a giving life. And then number five, the fifth result of living a life of faith is, of course, bearing fruit. Look at verses 13, 14. Paul says, I do not want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, but I plan many times to come to you, but have been prevented from doing so until now in order that I might have a harvest among you so that I might bear fruit just as I have a, among the other Gentiles. Paul just doesn't want to go through the routine of having a church for 80 years. He wants to bear fruit. He wants to see a harvest come. He wants to see people get saved. And he wants to see great things happen for the kingdom of God. Paul wants production. He wants to produce spiritual fruit. He wants people to hear this, this gospel. And he wants them to get saved and to grow in Christ and to change and to reach maturity. And that's what gets his juices going. He wants to see fruit. Do we want to see fruit in our own lives and especially in the lives of others? And that's what should get us going too. We don't want our church just to plateau, just to have business as usual. Now that the pandemic is over, we can just slide right in to going through the motions again. No, we want to see lives changed and we want to see spiritual life and growth and fruit and a great harvest. Amen? amen. That was a good amen. That was Paul's vision. That's what he lived for. And that should be our vision too. A faithful life is a fruitful life. We don't want to be satisfied with stagnation. Then number six, the sixth result of living a life of faith is obligation. Obligation. Look at verses 14 to 15. Paul says, I'm obligated. Do you feel obligated today? In a good way? Not in a forced way. Paul says, I'm obligated to both Greeks and non-Greeks, both to the wise and the foolish. It's interesting. Paul says, I'm not obligated to God. I'm obligated to people. Even people who might not be in my comfort zone or in my little group. Greeks and non-Greeks. Jews and Gentiles. Both to the wise and the foolish. Sometimes it's hard to be obligated to the foolish. The old saying is you can't fix stupid. <laughs> Sometimes it's hard to be obligated to foolish people. That, that, that's uh, Daryl's favorite saying. You, you can't fix stupid. And it's hard sometimes. Paul, of course he's obligated to God, but he's obligated to people. I find that so interesting. 
And then he says, that is why, at the end of uh, 15, he says, that is why I'm so eager to preach the gospel also to you who are in Rome. Paul felt obligated. He felt a deep debt to those who are lost. Do we feel obligated to come to church? Oh, well, that'll make the pastor happy if I come. That'll encourage him. That's nice. I appreciate that. But we should be obligated to the lost, to those who need to hear the gospel, even to people who are out of our comfort zone, to the wise and not so wise. That's what drove Paul. That's why he was so eager. Do we have that same obligation? That people here in Napanee need us. They need the salt that we have. They need the light that we have. People living all around us, they need to hear this good news. We need to be obligated to people. A faithful life is an obligated life. And then number seven, the seventh result of living a life of faith is being unashamed unashamed and Tom mentioned it earlier sometimes we get shamed by our culture look at verse 16 Paul says and, and this is the crescendo this is the climax of the passage Paul says for I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes first to the Jew then to the Gentile he says, I am not ashamed. Why? Because there's power in the blood. That's why there's power in the gospel. Just what we were singing about. And when we think back over our own lives, we see that power. We've been changed. I've said this many, many times. If you had seen me 45, 46 years ago, you wouldn't have recognized me, I don't think because it was the 70s and I wore platform shoes and I had shoulder length hair and wore a leather jacket and you probably would have walked right past me. There's power in the blood. There's power in the gospel. That's why it's so exciting because we see what God does in people's lives. In the 10 years that I've been here, I've seen it. I've seen it. In each one of your lives, I've seen God work. I've seen him change you. It brings salvation. It gives people forgiveness and freedom and hope for the future. That's why we shouldn't be ashamed. But like I mentioned, you know what? In our world today, Christians are being shamed left and right. We're being told in a lot of different ways and from a lot of different sources, if you're a Christian, you're a moron. You're hateful, you're bigoted, you're phobic, you're ignorant. And it's so easy to be intimidated, so easy to be shamed into submission. And in general, that's what has happened to the church. But we need to come back. We need to come back to this great statement. You don't think Paul had all those same kinds of insults hurled at him in his day? They had the exact same kind of culture, maybe worse than what we are going through right now. And yet he could stand up and say, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because that's where the power is. It is the power of God unto salvation, he says, to all who believe a faithful life is an unashamed life. I believe that's something to get excited about this morning. God saves us, and then he powerfully works in our lives. That's the gospel message, and he changes us from the inside out, and he helps us to lead a life of faith. We can't be any of these things, these seven things that we just talked about, if he's not helping us, if his spirit is not filling us and living inside us. But he wants us to be thankful and committed. He wants us to be praying and giving and bearing fruit and being obligated and especially not to be ashamed of what we believe. May we rise up as 
individual believers and as a local church and get excited again. Do I get a really big amen, an excited amen? Let's get excited about what we have in Jesus because it's really the only thing worth living for. And when we're lying on our deathbeds, what are we gonna be excited about? All the houses that we own, or the cars that we own, or the places that we travel to? No, all of that is gonna be gone and you're gonna be laying there empty if you don't have the gospel, if you don't have the hope of the gospel, if you don't have what we've just been talking about, that hope beyond this life. Because every other hope ends when this life ends. May we, we be people of hope. May we be people of excitement. May we be people that are serving God with fervor and eagerness and a willingness to live for him no matter what. And not to be ashamed. Amen, amen. and amen. Thank you.